You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Greetings, everyone. You're listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I'm your host, Doug Thorpe, and today we are going to talk about brand clarity. I have a lady joining me. Her name is Suzanne Tulian. And Suzanne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah, as am I. It's uh, it's always helpful. There's so much going on now in the world. And uh, I guess where I'm coming from, I think in terms of there's so much noise out there. So if you've got a business, you've got a product, you've got a service, you better do a pretty darn good job of defining your brand and telling that story. So uh, tell us how you got into this part of the business world, Suzanne. Well, I used to be on the marketing side. I used to be the one doing all that um, sensory, um, multi-sensory, like in, you know, inculcation out there, right? But I, I realized that so many companies were out there spending money in marketing to to market a message that they weren't even really fully aligned with, or even understood in terms of their own core value position. So I, I pivoted. Um, I was in marketing and communications and uh, advertising for years. And when I realized that all that was, or all what I was participating in doing was putting lipstick on the pig, so to speak. And I wanted to get to the core of my client's value position. And they had never really done the work before, the, the formalized deep dive work and flushing out those attributes that make them who they are, that make them different, and then um, help them align to that so that they're walking the talk and delivering on that promise. And when I pivoted and made that kind of distinction, I'm going to help you take a step back, stop marketing for now, and, and dive into the company and really unpack what is valuable in that company, what you guys stand for, and really know that and train your people on it. And that's how you begin to create the true distinction and delivering on that promise. Yeah. So that's what I kind of drank the Kool-Aid for me. <clears throat> to, uh, and I love it because I see it change everything there is about that company and how they operate in their energetic level to their behaviors, their actions, their vernacular, their narrative. So that they start showing up differently and people notice that. They notice that at a, a very interesting chemi chemistry level almost. Yeah. We've had uh, discussions on this program about that idea that if your culture doesn't support the brand that you've put out there, your brand is dead on arrival. <laughs> yes. and Or your brand story anyway, uh, because if you somehow paint the picture that you're this wonderful, glorious, collaborative community of professionals or, or people that are working to this great, wonderful end. But the first time a customer calls in the customer service and, and they get this, you know, really ugly, sharp course function, talking back at them, uh, it's like there's a disconnect right there. And then all of a sudden that word gets out and you've got problems, but you know, uh, there, there has been a pivot, I think of late, at least from where I sit, there has that companies are starting to get sensitive to living their brand and not mm -hmm. just picking a logo color and pasting right. it on a label and hoping that that tells the right story. Well, I always say uh, marketing might get your prospects in the door and the key word is might, right? You're spending a lot of dollars and you just still don't know if they're getting in the door. It might get them in the door, but it's your brand that keeps them coming back and telling their friends. Right. So you're right. You know, people are starting to pay more attention, but it, you know what, Doug, I think it, it ebbs and flows, you know, <clears throat> depending on the decade or depending on what's happening out there. Um, are they willing to stop for a moment, stop the momentum and whatever they're doing and really uncover these attributes and do the internal work necessary? And that's scary for a lot of companies because they don't, they don't think that stopping the momentum is, well, they think it's scary and they, they don't want to stop the momentum 
uh, even though they have no idea what's on the other side of stopping and getting clear and then starting that momentum with clarity, it's like running a business by default versus by design. And, and I think that's the scary part. And most of them don't have the recipe and the ingredients to put that brand together. And that's why I'm in business. That's why I do what I do with brand DNA methodology. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's so tricky to lead, create, and manage the right culture for what you're trying to achieve. And it, it obviously starts somewhere at the top of the house with the with the visionary and if you're a you know small business or mid cap company whatever the founder had in mind is is usually where it begins and but if it if the entity has been around for any length of time they've had to morph based on market shifts and market changes and everybody tells the famous Kodak story of of not embracing changes in the market but um, wh where do you typically start with a business when you go in and they ask you to come give them some help? Well, you know, I, I, I've worked with 30-year-old companies that have never done a formalized brand DNA fleshing out process initiative. And I've worked with brand new startups who have a vision and just don't, don't have a way to articulate it, put it in words, put it in definitions, put it in design, put it in processes so that they're like, they're birthing this company, but with real-time uh, buy-in and knowledge of what they want to become, which is what this methodology does. So it, it's harder to work with a 30-year-old company, right, who's established in certain behaviors, certain mindsets, certain policies and practices that may, not, may or may not align with their next level of evolution. So you got to kind of break down all of that system and process that's been built in culture, for sure. You have to break that down and kind of rebuild it with, with fresh but authentic, more aligned terminology that lends itself to creating tangible behaviors. So these words that we're coming up with for our brand, right, aren't just going to be in our marketing messaging. They're going to be infused into our actions and behaviors. Yeah. in every process that we have. So it's harder to do it with an older, more established company. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask what may be one of the obvious questions. Is is there a particular industry or market segment that you prefer to work with or that you consider yourself a better specialist in? Or does this stuff apply across the board? It, it really applies across the board because it's different for each company. It's very customizable because it's the company that comes up with the attributes through the unique activities in the methodology, the exercises within the methodology that I facilitate. I don't ever brand a company. I facilitate a process that flushes out their ability to name and, and step into that particular attribute or set of attributes. And, and maybe that lends itself to just talking about what a brand is and what it isn't, because a lot of your listeners may be um, thinking, like a lot of people do, that brand is the visual. It's the logo, it's the font, it's the, the, the what I call the trade dress, it's how your website shows up, but it's really not. Those are, those are marketing tools that communicate the message of the brand and get established as a graphic symbol that represents the brand. But the question still remains, what is it representing? So that's what I help companies do is really identify, define and align to that brand, your logo and website and all your messaging represents. So what is it representing? We gotta go all the way back to that brand component, right? And really flush that out. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm thinking about some of the probably more visible, you know, corporate type brands. For instance, I've, I've done work at Coca-Cola and, you know, their tagline is refreshing the world. And um, I, I think about Chick-fil-A and their, I don't know, I don't recall <laughs> if I should, but, uh, but, but they, connote this this wholesomeness about what they do you know and the the spirit of uh community that they try to assert 
uh, up to and including not being open on Sunday, you know, for, mm -hmm. for faith-based mm -hmm. reasons. Yep. Yes. But, mm -hmm. um, and, and that all, in my mind anyway, that all to me wraps into the brand and, and you, you get comfortable with who and what they are and you, and, and it's probably a little easier to relate to in a, in a fast food kind of way, because depending on the brand you're talking about, you kind of know what you're going to get when you walk in the store. You, mm -hmm. you kind of know, is it, is it going to be a hamburger? Is it going to be a fish sandwich? Is it going to be a, you know, a salad? What is it going to be, you know, depending on which one you've chosen. But I think it's in my mind, again, anyway, it's, it's harder with the companies that are a little more, um, specific about what they're doing. Like, I, for instance, I'm thinking of, I've got two big clients right now. One's a trucking company and one is a home builder. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you start having the brand discussion, uh, and I was talking with the home builder in the early stages of what we got going and I looked around, I said, I don't see any kind of statement about what you guys think you're doing here. <laughs> I don't see taglines anywhere. I don't see any messaging. I don't see anything i said let's let's talk about that what do you what do you think you're doing and the the owner had a good answer and i said i'm curious why you don't you know promote that why you don't have that out there and he said well for now in my opinion that's not what sells my houses <laughs> And I said, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. there's a lot more to that story, but. Um, yeah, yeah. So in my, in my mind, brand doesn't start in the marketing arena. It doesn't start there. It starts internally. Exactly. So, hence brand DNA, <clears throat> right? So we don't even know what we're marketing until we understand who we are as a brand. I mean, if we don't do that work in understanding who we are as a brand, then all we're doing in our marketing efforts are chasing the client. Right. We're just chasing them. We're, we're trying to figure out what they want, what they want to hear, blah, blah, blah. And then we bring them in. And it, if it's in alignment, great, then we might have a client. If it's not in the alignment to the message that's being promised out there in every facet of the customer experience, right? From the customer facing facet to the end job result, follow up, et cetera, then it's misaligned. And then you probably won't get a referral. You won't get the advocate. And you won't have turn a loyal client into an advocate. And then um, you lost, you basically lost that historical um, value of that client because right. they're probably a one time buyer, right? So it, so many people think that, you know, I'm going to brand myself on social media. I'm going to brand myself in the marketing efforts. And, you know, I'm doing, I'm going to just dump a ton of money into these marketing efforts when, again, all you're doing is chasing the client because you're not, um, and, and, and the problem with that is that it changes uh, according to what's happening externally in the environment of, of the world, right? In your markets, et cetera, instead of being, consistent in your stance, in your value position, in what you believe in, and promise to deliver. So that's just a recipe for disaster in my book. Right, right. Well, <clears throat> so often, and, and this is more true in the bigger companies, potentially millions of dollars get spent, you know, creating this brand image is what I'll call it, and pardon me if that's not the right word, but the 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 story they think they want to project, and uh, and a lot of it may be directly related to shifts in the market. And I'm I'm thinking, you know, in my backyard here, we have a lot of the oil and gas activity. So as you know, in the last decade or so, as the market mindset has shifted to renewables and carbon footprint and all of those issues, the traditional oil and gas company is kind of a pariah, you know, in, in the minds of many in the public. So the companies have all done their own shifts to try to move and prove that they're green and they're, you know, eco-friendly and all of that. But honestly, you go to the office and you start walking the halls and you listen to what people are talking about. And it's, uh, you know, it's drill, baby, drill, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and um, 
you know, it's it's going to be an evolutionary process for them to really position all of that correctly. Well, and they have to they have to walk their talk to really get the belief out there um, and the consistency going. You know, I, I think of Google when you talk about um, that uh, global wanting to really watch their global footprint and really uh, be stewards of the earth, so to speak. And they have launched several initiatives that um, are in full steam right now to help them reduce costs and energy and wind and solar and just all kinds of things that they can claim with quantifiable differentiators that they are actually doing. And so that's where the consumer sees that connection to maybe their own core values, right? And they become more of an advocate for that particular brand. But if you're just touting it because that's the phrase of the month or the phrase of the season, then um, consumers are smart. We pick up on that pretty quickly and we know what's true and what's false and our experiences of the, the delivery of the promise and whether that's in alignment with what they say they're promising or not. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of places to buy from. <laughs> and so we have choices. And as soon as we get dissed in terms of being the consumer with a, a promise that wasn't delivered on, we move on. And that's, you know, that's, that's the way it works in this world now. So right. your job is to right. get really clear <clears throat> and start delivering on that consistently with distinction and uh, have a lot of engagement. I don't want you to get yourself in trouble by naming any names, but have you ever had a client company where you've gone in and you've tried to begin the process and they just fundamentally don't get it or won't get it? And, yes. you know, your deal comes to an early end? Yes, I have. Absolutely. So um, I've, I've kind of refined my own intake processes so that I'm finding the client who gets it. And I won't engage until I've, I'm convinced that they have the desire, the passion, the vision, and the, um, the manpower to assist in this process to get it done, <laughs> you know, um, because it's a, it's a waste of both of our times. And I, you know, I'm not going to take a company's money if they're not interested in, in going the whole route. I, I think that idea of defining the brand message or the brand meaning, maybe meaning is the more important element. Defining that is, is sometimes really darn hard to do. If you don't have a process, it is. Yeah. That's why I have a process. <laughs> and, and I tell you, defining is one thing. Uh, I ident well, identifying the attributes, right. That, that make this, the perception, because all a brand is, is a set of perceptions. And if you, the question is, is first of all, every company has a brand. Every single company already has a brand and personal brands as well. The question is, are you in control of it as a leader, as an organization, or are you allowing or enabling your consumers or the community or the globe, right? to define it for you because you're all over the board, right? So the, the idea is it, once you get into control of it, you can identify, define, and then align. That's the missing piece that most companies don't do. They think that, that identifying and defining is a marketing task because now they have something they can go say that they do. They've got some catchy phrases and taglines and things like that. It's the alignment piece that most companies miss. And that's where I come in and I'm an expert at diving in and infusing these attributes into the core systems and processes, the leadership, and the way you operate, right? Your actions and behaviors. When that shifts and we become more consistent in that mindset, we create cultures that are um, on brand and it become ambassadors of the brand and customer service people and leadership. And we've got a vision, we can stay in our lane. We're not confusing our market space because we know what our brand is. We know what's on brand and off brand. Business is all about solving complex problems as fast as you can create them. Become the best problem solver by leading others to greatness too. And the first step is going to dougthorpe.com. Doug Thorpe is known globally for coaching entrepreneurs and business leaders, improving their performance and the work output of everyone surrounding them. You can find health, wealth, and happiness by learning to lead others to health, wealth, and happiness. 
Go to DougThorpe.com now and order Doug's books or hire him to coach your managers. That's Doug, T-H-O-R-P-E.com. You know, going back to my home builder example, as I got to work with them and got into the work with them, uh, one of the things that, and, and perhaps this is the DNA journey you're talking about, I just didn't call it that. Right. Um, what I discovered is, and I did a basically a, a company wide 360 interview. I interviewed every employee. I, I talked, I, I, and, and they're not a huge company, so that wasn't a big task, but I, I did interview every employee. And what I came away with is the owner's values of doing the right thing. That was, that was a core value. That was a deep rock of foundation that they were built on doing the right thing. And of course, when you're talking about home building, there's always budgets. And, and so you've got this notion of how do I do the right thing inside the budget I've got to, to make it a, a viable deal and, and the potential buyer is happy with it. But that had already permeated the whole team and, and everybody had a pride of, of being part of that effort. Mm -hmm. And the discussions were genuinely about a situation would come up and you could hear people asking the question, yeah, but what's the right thing to do here? You know, awesome. yeah, we might be bumping our budget, but what's the right thing to do here? Mm -hmm. And, and there are plenty of moments that I've seen and observed where even the budget was impacted because needing to do the right thing was going to cost more than you planned on. Mm -hmm. But they, they agreed that was the thing to do. So they were going to go do that. And, you know, I, I have told the owners, I said, that stuff is gold. If you can figure out how to, how to get that out of your, your own office and into the market, because for any of you who have gone out and had a custom home built or, or built on a higher end spec home builder, what do you run into? What's, what, what is that industry famous for? It's cutting corners, not doing things necessarily as good as they could or should be done. And uh, how rare is that to have a team that genuinely believes in doing the right thing? And it, uh, what it takes, Doug, is training. It's training and, um, you know, huddles and things that continue to reinforce the alignment of the brand and what we stand for. And that goes back to your initial story about you know, companies that don't have any messaging internally or a visual support internally um, that speaks to the, the brand. Um, and it's all external in terms of that doesn't make me business. Yes, it does. Because it really keeps your people aligned or helps reinforce the alignment of your people and um, keeps the 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 brand true to its own value position. Okay. How do you help, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you help business leaders that start to do this work? And as they start to see this picture come together, they might push back and say, Ooh, if we commit to that, we're going to eliminate this huge segment of the business, mm -hmm. this of the market. You know, there, there's, there's a, perceived huge segment that won't fit our definition of what we're doing or our direction we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So they kind of pause at that point and go, hmm, how do we factor in the opportunity for this other market or this other segment? Uh, it, you know what I'm, you understand what I'm asking? I do. And it's a huge question because it, it depends on specifics, you know, more rather than general. For sure. But when I help, companies understand that no brand is universal, meaning that they can't appeal to every single market segment. Um, otherwise they're diluting their own brand position and uh, others who are ready to rock and roll in that niche will go for it and, and probably you know over, overcome the market in terms of uh, their competition. <clears throat> but deciding whether the timing is right, deciding whether that niche that you think you're going to lose should be spun off 
into a new brand that focuses in that space that can speak that language that can do those things mm. specifically might be an interesting uh, option but again not having real detail in this case study we're we're kind of generalizing right, right. <laughs> But so there are other, there are a lot of things that um, when you own a space in the minds of your market, that's when you get to leverage it. But if you're spread out too much in too many market segments, then it's it's very very hard to leverage, you know, a, a brand position. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And and thank you for that. And I, I do agree. I mean, you got to get into some of the specifics to know mm -hmm. how that goes. But I asked the question based on smaller enterprises, smaller privately held companies where they're kind of trying to make their way and maybe they're sort of in stage two of their development. They've gotten past startup. So they've had some success. They've got a little bit of traction in the market and word is getting out about what they do. But then lo and behold, this potential client from another segment of the market shows up and says, if you can do this, can you do that? Uh -huh. And then um, the entrepreneur is, is in a conundrum there of saying, gosh, that could be another $2 million on my top side. Yeah, I'll do that. And, and, and then you immediately trigger this whole brand dilution, brand confusion. It's tough to stay in your lane. You know, um, maybe you do something like refer a business that you know that, that handles that or is an expert in that space and you create some sort of um, joint venture relationship where you have referral fees or like I'm thinking real estate, right? They have referral fees and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but something else can be done when you're, when you're thinking I'm going to lose this cash cow because I don't do that and I don't do it well. <laughs> How do you think you're going to perform <laughs> within that right. space for that? You know what I mean? So there's a lot of, a lot of things to consider when you're um, approached with that. And that's welcome to entrepreneurship, right? We had deal with that in our growth, in our own growth, um, I, well, I can do that. I got a little bit of expertise in that and not wanting to give it up and, but rather doing the right thing and sending it off to someone you trust and getting some sort of a, a fee, or maybe you support the company in certain areas that you are expert in and you have that other vendor help you with the other. Well, uh, right. I, I think it's a complex question. And, and to your point, it definitely has the potential of disrupting whatever momentum you've built. If you've started mm -hmm. to build people, process and systems around a certain direction of delivery, whether it's hard goods or services, uh, and then you get this curveball out of left field, albeit a giant cash cow potential, mm -hmm. You have to disrupt all those systems and training and process and everything. And then your your own employees are going, what the hell? I mean, what, what are we doing here? I've seen that be the demise of, of many small businesses where they just, they're so unclear about their own value proposition or value space that they, they feel that they can go after all these other areas just to capture that cash. And that's, you know, <laughs> it's confusing to the market. Uh, I'm all about becoming who you want to be known for. And you can't be known for every, well, I guess you can be known for a jack of all trades, but then you're an expert at none, right? So right. what do you want to be? Yeah. Right, right. It's one thing to want to find a good and capable, multifaceted handyman to do the small repairs at your house. And mm -hmm. so that means a little bit of plumbing, a little bit of sheetrock, a little bit of electrical and all that's good. But yeah, you're, you're not going to ask that guy to build your next house. No, right. <laughs> right. Right. So brand right. is really about um, getting, <clears throat> and again, everybody has a brand, good, bad, or indifferent, because all a brand is, is a set of perceptions. So the question is, is do you want to be in control of it? And if you do, you've got identified to find and align to it and become who you want to be known for. And so that's yeah. what the, the DNA and methodology is really all about. So how far down the food chain do you operate? And what I mean by that is, uh, do you ever take on an engagement with uh, a founder that is very much still in the startup phase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if they're willing to envision and be creative and do the work because it's really about um, making what's in their head tangible. 
So if they're ready to move forward and it's accelerated, once you get crystal clear through the methodology process, you are ready to accelerate because now you can make decisions that are on brand in everything that you do. So it, you know, I always tell my clients, after we get done with a brand DNA session, it's a one or two day process. Um, it's like, put your seatbelts on because <laughs> we're going to get going here. Now, now we know, right? We can yeah. move forward quickly. So I do do work with startups if they're willing to do that. So many startups think they're not ready. You know, maybe they don't have cash flow regularly coming in that they've got to get cash. Well, how are you going to get cash flow if you're not building trust, if you're not creating consistencies, if you're not building and clear on your brand, right? So it's like, do you want to start with a clean foundation and really get started in that, in that set of perceptions that you want to create and every movement you make forward is on brand? Or do you want to just like, you know, yeah. muddy it up? <laughs> I had a very interesting episode a while back. I interviewed the guy that was um, really the, it was technically an HR job, but he was the brand ambassador for Hard Rock Cafe. Oh, okay. And so you talk about an uh, extremely unique brand. And, I mean, when you hear anybody talk about the Hard Rock, what do you typically think about? Well, you I don't know about you, but what I think about is, uh, you know, high priced hamburger. Yes. But I also think about the pretty eccentric wait staff that's usually going to appear, you know? And so I asked him about that and he said, uh, yeah, he said it was a, it was a culture of broken toys. That's what he called it. <laughs> The land of the misfits. No. <laughs> he said, we, you know, we found the harmony. He said, but if you, if you ever met anybody that was a long tenured employee and there were a bunch, I mean, their, their retention rate is off the charts mm -hmm. Excellent for what they do. And he said, it's the broken toy found a home. You know, mm, nice. and they could be who they were with their purple hair or their nose piercing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, very much embraced by HR policy and and um, uh, more importantly, across the team. You know, there was a, there right. wasn't a manager that was going to condemn condemn you for exhibiting some tattoo you know, body part I tattoo yeah. ink very color, eclectic environment whatever very eclectic and and it was actually almost promoted that way mm -hmm. mm. and um so it you know it it just worked it it yeah. it was a very you know positive and still to this day does mm -hmm. so clarity is the basis for action and as soon as you get crystal clear, you can design instead of by default, right? Design the experience. And it's super powerful. Um, when my clients get through that particular process of fleshing that out, that's when Pandora's box opens up and they get super creative. And even in their different departments, um, how can they live this brand now? Now that they've named it, they've defined it. Now they're ready to align to it. So it gets really, really fun. I like that. And you you whispered a magic word, I guess. I'm, I'm old enough to know the old uh, uh, Marx Brothers show where when some, when a guest spoke the secret word, this bird would drop down and they'd <laughs> play music and everything. And uh, the word was clarity. Um, oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite words when I talk to leaders and, and do my advisory and coaching work. I try to help people find clarity because I love the phrase and I don't know who said it. I need to research it. I use it all the time. A confused mind says no. Right. Absolutely. And whether that's a customer or an employee, if they're confused, they're fundamentally going to say no. Right. And when it comes to your employees, this is another mantra that my listeners have probably heard me say multiple times. If you've done a reasonable job hiring your team, they want to do a good job. But if you don't help them understand what that is, if you don't give them that clarity, they're fundamentally going to do nothing. Right. They need to be able to hang their hat on something, some value position, some um, alignment for them to feel like their job it, it, what they're doing there is much bigger than their job. It's really about that much larger value position. I keep coming back to value position. 
Right. Um, have you read the book, The Experience Economy? It's kind of an old, older book. I don't think so. Joseph no. Fine and James Gilmore. They have a phrase in there um, that says, um, in the absence of a distinctive brand experience, price becomes the default in your customer's purchase decision. Ooh. It's so good. Yeah, that's so good. very good. So you can be a commodity and, and sell on basis on price, or you can be a unique, distinctive brand experience and create your own price point. So say that again. In the absence of a unique or distinctive brand experience, price becomes the default in your customer's purchase decision. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> it's great. I use it in my workshops all the time. It's great. I love that. I love that. I'm, I'm going to have to look that one up and add that to my repertoire because uh, <laughs> that is so pertinent uh, to the dilemma that most face. They feel price pressure and they, they're sitting there going, what's wrong with me? Why, why do I have to always talk price with people? Mm -hmm. But it is because they haven't successfully differentiated. They haven't uncommoditized their offering. So I recently worked with a, um, a mortgage firm and the, you know it's all about rates right it's all about rates and so we created this brand set of of attributes that they began living towards and they began talking about the value position when they're talking to their clients this is on the wholesale side so their clients are brokers and so they're talking about this value position and working with this this division this mortgage company and the long-term partnership, the white glove experience that, you know, you're always going to have our retention rate is this. You're always going to be talking about talking to your person, right? And who, it just went through the roof. I mean, they, they didn't even talk price anymore. And they, they work with all kinds of papers. I mean, A and B papers and, you know, but yeah so it really if you if you have the patience and take the time to unpack the brand value position and you're willing to walk that talk and really live it you've got a powerhouse of a brand i like it and, and to your point and you know mortgage business is a big part of my background and hmm. old dna and um yeah talk about a commodity product <laughs> if you know uh, well banking in general is just an incredibly commoditized industry and um talking about how to differentiate your offering as a as a either a, a mortgage lender or even a, a bigger you know bank that might be involved. That's such a challenge. Mm -hmm. It really is. Until it's I'm, not. <laughs> I'm of the old school early banking where, um, and people are going to laugh, but some will remember banks used to give away toasters if you came and opened a new account, you <laughs> yeah. know, and that I was remember. the way they differentiated. Hey, our offer of the week is a nice sunbeam toaster. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, you know, how archaic. <laughs> right. And, um, it's hilarious. You know, you yeah. can, it depends on what kind of market you're looking for, but uh, apparently that worked for a little while. <laughs> it worked for a little, uh, worked for a decade or two, you know, <laughs> those kind of giveaways. Um, I, I think all that stuff is outlawed now. I think the Fed has stepped in and yeah, you can't do that, but um, I don't know. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, well, Suzanne, uh, we're kind of getting near the stopping point here. Tell people how they can best get a hold of you if they're looking for help with their brand message and, and brand vision. Awesome. I am on all social media. I'm on LinkedIn and, and Facebook. So Brand Ascension and Suzanne Tuline, obviously. My website is brandascension.com. Um, you can book a discovery call with me from my website. So feel free to do that if you're looking at personal branding with within your company, if you're the solo professional or the brand DNA, which is the business brand DNA with employees. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of just, let's start talking about it. I've got a quick assessment tool you can go through to kind of reveal some of the, the challenges or opportunities you might have. And we could talk about that and see if it's a good fit. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we will have all of that information, folks, in the show notes, as always, if you need to get a link or, or find that reference point. But Suzanne, thank you so much for sharing with us. 
Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. I appreciate you. You bet. You bet. Well, folks, we are going to wrap this up. And as always, I want to remind you, if you're listening on your favorite streaming service, we do have a video version over on YouTube, channel by the same name, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Wow, you said LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, leadership Powered by Common Sense. That's the name. And uh, go over there and check us out and see the, the great show uh, over there. But for now, we're going to sign off, say goodbye, and thank you so much for listening in. We hope this was helpful and want to help you build your best brand story. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.